Hello. I've been told we can get started, so I'm going to get started. Uh, welcome back to the, the second week of Shakespeare 151. Uh, I'm Dr. Connor again. And before we get started, uh, a couple of little announcements. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions you have, either during the talk or questions that I can answer next week at the start of next week's talk or whatnot. Uh, you can email them at uh, to lifelonglearning at wichita.edu. That's one word, lifelonglearning at wichita.edu. And they'll pass them on to me. Uh, or you can send them to me personally, francis.connor at wichita.edu. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, don't use the live chat because nobody is monitoring that. But if you email questions to either of those, uh, we'll, we'll see what I can do with them. Uh, there is a microphone set up front for comments, questions, etc. cetera. Uh, let them, uh, you feel free to uh, walk up and speak into it. Uh, hopefully I'll have the, uh, the camera to see if somebody's at the microphone. Uh, please stand on the X marked on the floor and don't touch the mic when you're asking a question. Uh, I, I'm going to leave about a 10 minute break, about 50 minutes in. We'll have a, we'll have a little break after 50 minutes. And I'll leave 10 minutes at the end of the second hour uh, for people who want to ask questions or make comments or make requests or anything else. So um, with that, let's, let's start what we're doing this week. So last week, we focused on a, a light, slightly tragic, uh, certainly erotic, mostly comic poem from early in Shakespeare's career. This week, we're sort of like the, the contrary state of the human soul. We're, I'm gonna talk a lot about the bleak, dark, macabre tragedy. Uh, although one that I, I think is really funny, uh, and that would be Titus Andronicus. Uh, so we're still early in, in Shakespeare's career, this play, Shakespeare probably wrote uh, a couple of years before uh, Venus and Adonis, uh, although it's not credited to him for, for much later in his, in his career. Um, and, uh, but to start, uh, well, what it's, Titus Andronicus is what we call a revenge tragedy. And this is a popular subgenre in Shakespeare's time in early modern England. Uh, so I wanna talk about that, that genre, I talk a little bit about revenge, talk a little bit about genre. Uh, and then I wanna go into, since this is the first play we're looking at in this course, uh, a brief talk about the spaces in which Shakespeare's plays were performed to give you some ideas if you're reading the plays yourself, the sort of physical space he had to, to work with. So you can imagine the actors moving around and whatnot. Uh, so to, to start, um, the next slide, please. So the, the first folio of Shakespeare, the edition of collected works that appears in 1623, seven years after he dies, that collects most of his dramatic work, it's organized into comedies, histories, and tragedies. It's organized by genre. Uh, and the, the two core genres, dramatic genres in Shakespeare's time were comedy and tragedy. And fundamentally, they were sort of diametrically opposed to one another. And this little chart lists, it, lists those opposition, right? Comedies are often plays that end in social cohesion, right? The, the familiar way you've heard this described is that comedies usually end in a marriage, uh, which isn't always the case, but usually the case is that somehow at the end of a comedy, everyone comes together, has a laugh, and is, is happy. Even if the play begins in chaos, a comedy will end with some sort of happy resolution. Uh, tragedies don't always work that way. Uh, they may begin with social cohesion and end with social fragmentation. They may begin with social fragmentation uh, and end with even more fragmentation. Uh, Titus Andronicus sort of it begins with a lot of chaos and ends with slightly less chaos, which is a bit unusual for a tragedy. And we'll, we'll talk about why that may be so. Um, comedies, uh, they usually aren't based around a single character. And if you think of the name of the names of Shakespeare's comedy, they're Twelfth Night, All's Well, The Ben Wells, Two Gentlemen of Verona. You don't usually see 
individual names in the title of comedies because they're about societies, communities. Tragedies are usually Titus Andronicus, the tragedy of Hamlet, the tragedy of King Lear, right? They're about uh, an individual. And this focus affects the way that the, the language of the drama comes together. So comedies, a lot of the language is gonna be in dialogue, one character talking to another character and, and making jokes. There aren't a lot of big, long monologues in, in comedies. Uh, tragedies are where you have to be or not to be and whatnot, the big speeches and monologues that reveal the interiority of a character. Uh, comedy with a social cohesion, the characters are often approved at the end. Tragedies, uh, as you may be familiar with, if you were able to read Titus Andronicus, ends with a lot of bodies on the stage. Uh, and the, the humor of comedies often comes from wordplay, uh, wit, puns, things like that. Where tragedy, uh, there's a lot of humor in Shakespeare's tragedies. It's very bleak, dark humor. Uh, for example, as we see in Titus Andronicus, a, a man being tricked into cutting his arm off, right? It's funny, but it's bleak funny, not ha-ha funny. Uh, so generally, these are the, the two binary generic modes. Uh, histories, histories can either be based on comedy or based on tragedy. So a play like Henry V uh, is a history play, but it's more comic because it ends with France and and... England being united and a wedding and all that, but something like King Lear ends in tragedy because it ends with uh, Cordelia and Lear dying. Um, so history can be either. Um, and this is more of a guideline because Shakespeare often doesn't stick to the conventions of genre and he often plays with the expectations, with an audience's expectations for what a genre is supposed to do. Um, a, a good example is Romeo and Juliet, which is essentially a comedy until Mercutio gets killed and then it turns to tragedy. Uh, so uh, Shakespeare sort of undermines your expectations. You kind of know the story of Romeo and Juliet, but it's beginning like a comedy, but then he pulls the rug out under you. He's, he's very good at that. Love's Labor is Lost is another one. It's a comedy for, for most of it, but at the end, uh, we don't get a wedding. Instead, we get the announcement that the princess's father has died and that happy ending has to be delayed. So Love's Labor is Lost is a comedy, but it doesn't end like a conventional comedy. It actually ends in a way that's slightly more akin to a tragedy, although no one would actually call it a tragic play. Tragedies themselves, there are a, a couple of traditions of tragedy that Shakespeare and other playwrights are working with. The, the classical model, the one we're familiar with, uh, the hamartia, the idea of a fatal error. Uh, the often you, the the way it's commonly taught is the tragic flaw, right? The, the heroic, the tragic hero has some characteristic that uh, inevitably leads to a, a tragedy. Uh, you think of maybe Hamlet's indecision or Othello's pride, right? Those are based on, on classical models of Oedipus's anger, right? Leads him to uh, um, the, the, trage the tragedy that befalls him. Uh, the De Casabus tragedy is something you see a lot in medieval literature. It's the idea that all great men inevitably fall. Uh, it doesn't find its way into a lot of drama uh, but you see a, a very popular poem that slightly predates Shakespeare is called The Mirror of Magistrates, which is just a collection of poetic stories about great men. Uh, fortune allowed them to get to the top of the wheel where they accomplish great things, but fortune's wheel inevitably turns and they fall. It's a fact of life and you have to acknowledge that. And the Casabu's tragedy is about that. Wherever we, whatever our status in life, uh, we can't maintain it. Uh, revenge tragedy is the big one. It, it's rooted in classical tragedy. And thematically, it, its core interest is uh, an individual responding to an injustice. Uh, the idea that when people find themselves in a position where nobody can help them, where they are wronged and nobody can help them, what right do they have to seek their own justice? And if we go to the next slide. Um, oh, a couple of attitudes about this in, in early modern England, and it's, it's worth 
keeping in mind that in in this time there's really no there's no organized police force there's really no organized courts there are laws there are constables there are magistrates but they're very local and very arbitrary uh, and uh, you know there is the king's rule and you know being the king what he says go but uh, on, on the individual level, if something happens to you, there's not necessarily a mechanism to make that right, to punish people for doing wrong or to get compensation for losing things. So this is the, how can we call it, the uh, social context that underlies a lot of revenge tragedy. So if someone murders someone from your family and the local constable won't or for whatever reason can't do anything about that. What, what right do you have? Now, people in England, religious people, legal people, were aware of the, this problem. And the impulse was to create an ideological framework where revenge was bad. So the first quote we have, we have here, uh, it's from the from Re the book of Romans in the Bible. Uh, Dearly beloved, uh, avenge not yourselves, but give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Uh, in other words, don't take vengeance on yourself, because only I, the Lord, can uh, right a wrong, can correct a wrong. So you cannot murder someone who murdered someone in your family because all of that justice is mine, saith the Lord. And this was a concept that appears in a lot of sermons in early modern England. So your average playgoer, playwright, would know that there is a Christian precept against revenge. Francis Bacon, the second quote, uh, also describes what would be what we might call the political a uh, precept against revenge. In one of his essays where he describes revenge as a kind of wild justice, wild, right, untamed, not civilized, but wild justice, uh, which the more man's nature runs to, the more ought law to weed it out, right? The more people are likely to turn to revenge, the more the law should step in and rectify that situation. Uh, for as for the first wrong, it doth but offend the law, but the revenge of that wrong pulleth the law out of its its office. Right? Um, as it it's just like the wrong that is being avenged, it offends the law, but it's it's a particular disgrace to the office of law because uh, in taking revenge, he says, a man is but even with his enemy, but in passing it over, he is superior. For it is a prince's part to part to pardon. Right. So. You can get that visceral uh, sense of making things even if you take revenge, but you're still violating the law, right? Even though you might be justified in seeking revenge on your neighbor, you've still broken the law. And that's kind of a almost worse offense, right? Because you're, you're doubling down on wrong. You're trying to fix a wrong with more wrong, and that can be potentially societally destabilizing. So these two ideas were ones that are very popular in Shakespeare's time, and he and a lot of his audience would have held them, right? Only God has the right to revenge, only the prince and the law has the right to avenge. But the tension in something like a revenge play is, but what if it's not obvious that God is going to step in and make things better? And what if it's very clear that you're not going to get justice? That very quote at the bottom from, from Hamlet, right? No, no place indeed should murder sanctuaries. Revenge should have no bounds. Now, this is Claudius, so it's, it's an interesting case. But his, his idea is that this is where he's talking to Laertes and trying to convince Laertes to uh, set Hamlet up in revenge for uh, Hamlet's role in making Ophelia mad and for killing uh, Laertes' father and all of the... Uh, uncouth stuff Hamlet does in his in his play, uh, and, and Claudius is saying uh, Laertes, Laertes is worried about killing Hamlet in a church. Laertes is saying 
but no place should be a guard against murder because revenge should have no bounds, right? You should, if you're taking, if you're wronged and nobody is going to fix it, your impulse to revenge should not be bounded, right? You, uh, to rectify this wrong, it's worth going against God. It's worth going against the state because what else is going to happen? You, if you don't take any action, a murderer goes free and you get no justice. So revenge tragedies play off of these conflicting ideas. Revenge is wrong, it's, it's, it's theologically wrong, it's politically wrong, but sometimes it's the only option. And a lot of revenge tragedies, you see people in the face of these wrongs seek revenge anyway. Often because of this, at the end of revenge tragedies, society does completely fall apart. And again, Hamlet is a great example. Hamlet listens to his father, gets revenge on the people who killed his father, but at the end, he's dead on the stage and Fortinbras has come to take over Denmark. So his uh, country has collapsed at the end of Hamlet because he, he got revenge. But was Hamlet entitled to revenge? Well, the person who wronged his father is now the king. He's got no place to turn to to rectify that. He has to take it in his own hand if he wants justice for his father. And if he doesn't get justice for his father, he's dishonoring his family. So Hamlet is trapped in these different frameworks. And even though it is a tragedy at the end that uh, Denmark falls, um, nevertheless, we as, as audience members, we sympathize with, with Hamlet. We know he's in an impossible situation. And uh, you know that's a big part of the tragedy of Hamlet, that someone completely unsuited to make revenge actually has to, to do it. So... These are the cores behind revenge tragedies, behind Titus Andronicus. Um, you go to the, the next slide. So the, the key influence behind revenge tragedy in England is the Roman playwright Seneca. Uh, there are, I won't get too far into this, but uh, they can't read Greek in England. Uh, Greek texts aren't printed. So a lot of the classical, all of the classical dramatic tradition is through Latin authors. Uh, for comedy, it's Terence and Plautus, and for tragedy, it is Seneca. Uh, Seneca the Younger, very famous also as, as a moralist, uh, as a Stoic. Uh, a Stoic uh, essentially believed that the, the ultimate happiness is... Uh, rationally accepting your situation, whatever it may come to, right? Attaining virtue. Um, Seneca was a standard, was core to English humanist education. Uh, he, was, he was read, although not so much for his Stoic ideas, you, you actually don't see a lot of Stoic philosophy in English writing at the time. Uh, but as a stylist, uh, uh, Seneca's works are very, uh, his plays uh, consist of very long, elegant, flowery, complicated speeches. And he was considered a model for how to write proper prose. They mentioned last week during their biography of Shakespeare, he probably went to a free school where they read an awful lot of Latin. Shakespeare would have been well acquainted with Seneca. And when the public theaters are reopened at the end of the, or, well, public theaters develop at the end of the 16th century and dramatic authors want models for tragedy, uh, Seneca is the author that they, they go to. So he, he was incredibly influential on English drama and we'll see some of the ways in Titus Andronicus. Um, the mob for Titus Andronicus in particular is a play called Fiestes, uh, which begins with the ghost of Tantalus, uh, who is awakened by a fury and is told that you are going to watch, because of your crimes, you're gonna watch the rest of your family collapse. Uh, the key action are a couple of brothers, Fiestes and Atreus. Uh, um, Fiestes has banished 
uh, Atreus and uh, taken over uh, and taken over the rule of, of the country and at the end of it uh, to get his punishment uh, Atreus kills Fiesti's sons and bakes them in a pie and makes him eat them which of course is you can see where that inspiration for Titus Andronicus comes from. Uh, but Fiestes also asks some of these questions about revenge, right? Fiestes, and these, this is the dialogue at the very end. Fiestes, who punishes crime with crime? What's the point of punishing crime with crime? Uh, what, that's, that's immoral, destabilizing, all of that stuff. Uh, Atreus responds, oh, thou grievest that I have forestalled thee in the crime and art distressed. Uh, you're only upset because thou didn't suffer me. You would have gotten revenge against me if I hadn't gotten revenge against against you, uh, which might be a commentary on the inevitable cyclical nature of, of revenge. Uh, Thiestes only hope at the end the gods will be present to avenge. Uh, at least at the moment, he feels. Uh, Thiestes is kind of, he used to be a bad guy, but he's learned to be good. Uh, so it's, it's a, actually a bit of a tragedy that he suffers so much in this play. Uh, and he hopes the gods will will avenge will avenge him. So, Thiesti is very much a model for revenge tragedy, uh, not just in language and plot, but in that the kind of ornate macabre. Uh, how can I put it? Um, well, action of the revenge itself. Uh, so, next slide, please. We'll bring this into England now. So very much taking his cues from Seneca, it's Thomas Kidd. Uh, the Spanish tragedy is probably the, is the first native English revenge tragedy. Uh, it's also the first blockbuster play. This was incredibly popular in early modern in early modern England. Uh, there are records of dozens of performances of the Spanish tragedy. It's published an awful lot. Uh, it takes a lot of elements from Seneca. It begins with the ghost of revenge. Uh, it has an elaborate revenge plot, except instead of a, a cannibalistic feast, it ends in a, uh, a mask where people think they're just performing a tragedy, but it turns out uh, their people are really getting killed. Seneca is quoted in the play. And so it's very much model on that, except it tones down a lot of the stylistic excesses of Seneca uh, into something more accessible for the public theater. It's a fantastic play that I, 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 I highly recommend. Thomas Kidd himself, we, we don't know an awful lot about because the Spanish tragedy is the only play we think he wrote, even though the testimony of other contemporary playwrights suggests he wrote a lot of plays and was quite famous. One of the plays he may have written was an early version of Hamlet, which needs to be alluded to uh, in the early 16th century. That may have been a model for Hamlet. Uh, but Shakespeare's Hamlet uh, owes a lot to, to Thomas Kidd. Right? Hamlet includes a ghost uh, who demands revenge, as does Kidd's Spanish tragedy. Uh, both plays have a tragic protagonist who delays the act of revenge until they can get more proof. Uh, both of them have a female character who goes insane and kills herself. Both of them have a tragic hero who may or may not go mad and wants other people to think they are mad, but may or may not be mad themselves. They both have a to be or not to be type speech. They both have a, uh, a mask. Um, it, it seems really like, I think, I very much think Shakespeare had the Spanish tragedy on his writing desk. And we can go to the next slide, uh, which is an image from Spanish tragedy. I think very much Shakespeare had Spanish tragedy on his writing desk while he was composing Hamlet. All of this is a long-winded way of saying, you should read the Spanish tragedy if you like Shakespeare to find where a lot of Shakespeare comes from. It's, a, it's an astonishing play. Uh, this is a woodcut from a uh, later edition of the Spanish tragedy, and it's kind of the, the only printed image of a revenge drama that we have in, in the period. And I just, I, I like to show it in this context because it's a very iconic 
uh, image uh, of the the tragic scene that a lot of people that resonated with a lot of people in Shakespeare's time. Uh, this is when Horatio or Hieronimo, who is the gentleman in the beginning, in the middle of this image, uh, finds his son Horatio, who is the person hanging from the bower. And on the left hand side is uh, Bell Imperia, who loves Horatio, uh, who is being taken away. She's crying murder. And one of the uh, one of the murderers, uh, Don Lorenzo, is saying, "Stop her mouth!" And, and carrying her off. This is a moment of great pity because once the Bell Imperia and the murderer leave the stage, uh, Hieronimo uh, laments on his deceased son and says, "When I find out who does who who does this, I'm going to get uh, revenge." So this is for historical purposes. Um, on to the next slide. And, okay, one second here because I have my own notes out of order. I apologize. Um, so, Titus Andronicus, uh, to, to shift a little bit from the notion of the historical context for revenge tragedy to performance it itself. This is an image from the account book of a gentleman named Philip Henslow. Philip Henslow was the manager of the Rose Theater, which is one of the major public theaters in Shakespeare's time. We don't have a lot of theatrical records from Shakespeare's period. So this account book is one of the few documents that gives us a day-to-day -day record of a theater in operation. And I showed this here because this one includes a recorded performance of Titus Andronicus on February 23rd, 1594, not long after the theaters would have reopened after the plague. There are two other performances uh, earlier, I think way back in 1592. Uh, and this one at the beginning is marked with it. You can see right to the right of the blue arrow, that is an NE, which signifies a new play, uh, either a new play or a revival of a play that hadn't been performed in a while. And I think that's the case of Titus and Andronicus. So uh, Titus appears a lot in this common, in this account book. So it, it was also like the Spanish tragedy, a really popular play in, in its time. Um, Next slide, and then this will take us into, so what is this about? Um, so just to give a little bit of background on how plays would have been staged, the spaces they would have been sh staged in in Shakespeare's time, there are three main places that plays would be performed in London that Shakespeare would have been associated with. Uh, one of the public theaters, which is the theater you're probably most acquainted with, the Globe, the big outdoor theaters. Uh, second are the private theaters, which are indoor theaters that come along later. Uh, and the third is Whitehall. And Whitehall is the place in uh, where Queen Elizabeth or King James later would invite theater companies to perform. It's an indoor palace space that we're recognizing is, is more important to uh, um, Shakespeare's company than we possibly had before. This image here too, this is a woodcut from about 1638, and it shows the, the Southwark section of London. And all of the London theaters are in Southwark, in the south, uh, across the Thames River. You literally have to take a boat to see them. Uh, and that's important because being in Southwark, they're not governed by the laws of the city of London. And that meant, well, the city of London didn't really care what they staged across the river as long as it wasn't too seditious or too blasphemous. They were pretty much free to do as they wanted to there. Uh, so, you know, that's the reason you can put on plays about kings being killed and things like that. Because as long as it's kept over there, as long as it's isolated, and you don't bring that stuff over to the city proper, and you can see St. James's Cathedral is the big building across the Thames on the right. Uh, as long as it stays in this bad section, that's fine. And Southwark is the bad section of town. It's where the 
gambling houses, the ale houses, the brothels, all that stuff there. In fact, those three, I don't know if you can see them here. Do you, um, at the very bottom across from Southwark, he, Southwark, you can see a couple of buildings with flags on the top. Uh, two of them are theaters. One is this, the one on the far left is the Swan Theater. One on the far right is the Globe Theater. But the one just a little bit to the left of the Globe Theater, kind of near the center, that's the Bear Garden. And it's called the Bear Garden because, uh, well, it's not a theater. It's a place where you can see bear baiting. It's a place where people would, for entertainment, watch bears fight. And I always like to mention this as a reminder that while we often think of Shakespeare as the pinnacle of art, uh, he's really, um, his audience at his time were going to watch Hamlet in the Globe and then going across the street to watch bears fight in the Bear Garden. So he's really embedded in popular culture which means we should aspire to have fun with Shakespeare rather than, uh, you know, maybe treat him as much the icon as we do. Uh, okay, next slide, please. And this is a, this is the one contemporary drawing we have of an early modern playhouse. And I apologize because I've totally lost my notes on this. So I'm just gonna go pro and wing it. Um, this is the Swan Theater. It's written by a, a Swiss, it's drawn by a Swiss tourist named Johann de Witt, who was very invested in uh, who was a, a, a traveler who was impressed by the English theaters. So he decided to sketch one out for posterity. And so it, it shows us how a theater, a public theater, an outdoor theater would have been designed. So you see it is, there is no, um, there is no curtain. There's no space for a curtain. Everything is just the stage that extends into the audience and people would stand around that area in front. You would pay a penny and you can stand and watch the, the theater. Uh, the slightly more expensive seats are on the, the balconies around the sides. You pay an extra penny for those. Uh, if you wanna sit on a cushion uh, because, and you might want to because the benches were made of wood and that's very uncomfortable, that is another penny. But the, the design of the theater, uh, you see at the very back of the lower stage, there, there are two doors. And any time an actor needs to get on stage, they're coming in and out of those two doors. They're not coming up from the audience. There's no side entrances, uh, not anything like, like that. So anytime you see someone enter, you might imagine those doors. And often the trick would be to associate one of those doors with the location. So for example, uh, if you were showing something like King John, where there's a parlay between the English and the French, the English might come out of the left door, the French would come out of the right door, and then that right door would always be France and the left door would always be uh, England. So now it's not, it might be a little tricky to see here, but there is an, an upstairs, uh, a balcony area up there, uh, the upper stage, which is literally above the rest of the stage. Uh, that was also a stage, that is a staging area as well. I mean, another obvious one, right? Romeo and Juliet, when Juliet comes out on her balcony, that's probably where she would enter. Uh, it was an upper space, often musicians were up there. Uh, people could pay to sit up there. Those were the really expensive seats. If you were a, a wealthy nobleman who wanted to show off, that's probably where you would sit. Uh, and in fact, there's some thinking that, uh, actors wouldn't necessarily play to the audience standing in the round around the stage, but might play a little more to that upper gallery and the, and the people up there. Uh, so, uh, I mean, a couple of other things, the, the roof is, is, is labeled as tectum, uh, which literally means straw roof. The roof is made of straw, which they would be for until uh, 1614 when uh, at the second Globe Theater, a cannon that is lit during a performance of Henry VIII 
catches the straw roof on fire and the entire second globe theater burns down, which is probably a reason why we don't have a lot of theatrical records from the, the period. So this, these, there's no fire codes in these theaters, no public bathrooms. Uh, people are eating and drinking uh, all, all over the place. It's, it's probably slightly a mess, but you, you get to see a play and it's, it's fun. At the very top, there is a, it, it's hard to see from a distance. Um, there is a person above the, uh, it's on the left-hand side. You see the flag up there. Uh, and when the flag is up, that means a play is being performed. Just underneath that, it's actually a dude with a horn, with a flag on that, who would be uh, blowing the horn to announce that it is playtime. And plays were usually staged in this period in the, in the early afternoon. So this is a theater called The Swan. This is one of those theaters in Southwark that is pictured in the woodcut from the previous slide. Uh, can we go to the next one, please? Uh, this is an image of, this is what's left of the Rose Theater. And this is where Henslow's account book comes from. Uh, it's also in Southwark. Uh, the image on the left is from a, an excavation in 1989. Uh, Southwark, even though it was the bad section of town in Shakespeare's time, now it is some of the most expensive real estate in the world. And when they were building condos in the late 80s, they were uncovering all sorts of theatrical artifacts. They actually uncovered the original space of the globe and they uncovered the Rose Theater. Uh, and you can, um, the left-hand side is one of the initial pictures. The right-hand side is what they do now They've actually preserved the space somewhat. I think they somehow managed to still build the office park or condominium or whatever they were doing there on top of it. But they use lighting to mark off where the, the stage was. And if you see that little, uh, kind of in, in the center, there is that, uh, um, how can I, with the, the words escaping me, I'm sorry. I'm used to having a pointer, um, but. <laughs> Uh, you can kind of see in the round there, that's where people would, would stay near the bottom of the picture. That's where the audience would be. And there's that straight line with a little bit of a bend there. That's where the stage would have been. And you can apparently go there now and walk and see where plays by Marlowe and Shakespeare would have been staged. Titus Andronicus's performances were, uh, some of them would have been at the, Glo the Rose Theater. Um, the next slide. That's the big one. The, the Rose Theater is torn down in 1605. It's eventually replaced by the Globe Theater. Uh, and the Globe comes about because, uh, as I mentioned last week, in 1594, Shakespeare founds a theater company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men. They're incredibly successful. In 1599, they decide they want their own theater, so they build the Globe. Uh, they build it from wood taken from an, an older theater in London, which they, they literally move like in the dark of night across the, the river into Southwark. And it's, um, it's the public theater where a lot of Shakespeare's was, uh, plays were staged. Now, of course, this isn't the original globe. This is the replica globe that was found, funded by the actor Sam Wanamaker. Uh, it's actually become a very good educational resource for Shakespeare. Uh, you can see plays done in uh, Shakespearean style there. They try to follow original practices as much as possible. Uh, you'll see it, it's, uh, um, it's a lot of research went into this. One of the big debates was how much color there was on the stage. And you'll see that the marble, the, the pillars are wood, but they're colored marble. Uh, there's kind of an uh, astrology. There are pictures of planets underneath the roof above the stage, uh, colored curtains and things like that. Uh, can we go to the, the next slide? So this is what it looks like from a front. And this is this is the image I like to use in classes when I'm working with students to to block plays to talk about how they might have been staged in Shakespeare's time. It's very similar to that drawing of the Swan. Uh, it has the two entrance doors in the back. You can see the upper stage, the the railing up there. Uh, there is also you can't quite see this. Uh, the Swan had this too, but there is a trap door. 
Uh, so you can go down underneath the stage. And they actually called that trapdoor hell, possibly because the first time it's used in an English drama, it's used prominently in an English drama, is in Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, where Faustus is literally dragged into hell at the end of the play, spoiler alert. Uh, that would also be used for, for example, when uh, Hamlet jumps into Ophelia's grave, the open grave may have been the, the trapdoor at the bottom. Uh, there's one big difference and that is there, there are the entrance doors on the left and right, but there's also one in the middle that's called the discovery space. Uh, it's kind of a central entry place, but it might not, we're not sure whether or not it goes all the way back to the tiring room, to the, the dressing rooms. Uh, it's, it's often curtained or covered by decorative hang, hangings. And it's usually used in plays when somebody needs to hide. So, Polonius in Hamlet, right, when he's trying to overhear Hamlet talking to his mother right before Hamlet accidentally kills him, is probably hiding in the, the discovery space. So these are examples of what the public theaters would have looked like. And they're all outdoors. Uh, they're big spaces, very inexpensive entertainment, incredibly popular in Shakespeare's time. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, when, when plays were published, they often announced where they were going to be staged as a kind of, you know, you, you saw this play so-and-so, now you can read it. So, for example, on, on the left, uh, the title page to Shakespeare's Henry IV, Part Two, where it announces, as it hath been sundry times publicly acted by uh, the Lord Chamberlain, his servants. Uh, it's acted by the Lord Chamberlain's men since it's published in 1600. That would mean it was staged at the, the Globe. Uh, the one on the right-hand side, Troilus and Cressida, as it was acted by the King's Majesty's servants at the Globe. The King's men are what, how the Lord Chamberlain's men were renamed after King James I take the, takes the throne. So when you're publishing, when books are published, they often announce where the plays are performed to. So you can... Uh, either remember those performances that you saw or be on the lookout for them if you like reading the play. So a big problem with the outdoor public theaters, and go to the next slide, uh, it's that they're outdoors. And we all know the stereotypes about English weather, right? It's rainy, it's cold, it's hot, hot in the summer, uh, not so, Shakespeare's Lord Chamberlain's men or the King's men, their income depends on frequent performances. And if you have an outdoor theater, it's hard to perform in the rain, it's hard to perform in the winter. So at some point, uh, Shakespeare's men decided they wanted an indoor place to play uh, and they found Blackfriars. And Blackfriars, because of some weird zoning thing. It's not in Southwark, it's in the city proper, uh, but it is an area where they are actually allowed to perform plays. And early, earlier in the 1600s, Blackfriars was a popular place for children's companies to perform, where they would have children perform uh, actors, uh, perform plays, which was kind of a novelty that, that didn't last. Um, so the, the shift to an indoor theater Change a bit about Shakespeare's plays. Uh, it's more expensive. It, it's a penny to get into a public theater, maybe maybe two pennies if you want an actual seat. Uh, here it's between six pennies and two shillings to sit. It's, it's six cents to get in. Two shillings might get you one of those seats on the stage. You can sit on the stage right next to the performance, which would be great. The more material, so, fewer people can see these plays. And you, you can sort of see the track where theater goes from a popular form of mass entertainment to how it kind of is now, where it costs $500 to see Hamilton, right? Blackfriars is part of that development. But a more material change, uh, there is, there is um, there's more opportunities for music because you're indoors, right? People can actually hear it properly. Uh, there, there are no pillars, so that changes the way you kind of stage things. There's no obvious hiding space. That middle door might be just a little more. But outdoors, you have natural lighting. And indoors, you don't. 
So theaters indoor had to be lit with candles. And candles have a burning time of about 20, 20 to 30 minutes. And once they burn down, you have to change them. So in the theater, the easy way to do that is to stop the action, clear the stage, replace the candles. So this is really where act scene breaks become standard in drama. Uh, there's always, based on Seneca, Seneca's plays are divided into five acts. So there's always kind of a five act structure to plays, but uh, Blackfriars is when uh, they start taking seriously that idea and, and including intermissions and things like that. It's to change the, the candles. Um, this is again, not the, not the real Blackfriars. I think, I believe the real Blackfriars burnt down in the Great Fire, I think. Uh, this is a reproduction that's in Staunton, Virginia, which is a lovely nine hour drive from Wichita and I highly recommend it. They stage plays here and it's, it's a fantastic, very intimate space to watch a Shakespeare play. And then the performers there have a lot of fun with them. So I really recommend it for a, a spring a spring drive once they're staging things there again, I guess. Uh, okay, um, next slide, please. And this is just, uh, again, it's another title page that shows, in this case, uh, Taming of the Shrew, as it was acted by his majesty's servants at the Blackfriars and the Globe. So Taming of the Shrew would be performed both in the public theaters and in the private theaters of, of Blackfriars. Uh, so next slide, please. And I don't, I apologize for a second. I don't have an image, there isn't a good contemporary image of Whitehall, the, the court performance space. Uh, so I just list here a couple of title pages that announce when Shakespeare's men played uh, a couple of, performed a couple of plays at Whitehall. Uh, Love's Labor's Lost, which was produced before her, performed before Her Highness uh, this last Christmas. Uh, and uh, the most Merry Wives of Windsor on the left, uh, as hath been performed, and I'm sorry, I'm looking at my own screen on this, acted by the Right Honorable Lord Chamberlain Service before Her Majesty and elsewhere. Um, acted before Her Majesty, uh, the Queen will not go to a public playhouse, she won't even go to a private playhouse, the Queen has theater come to her, and that's why they perform at the court and, and Whitehall. This was, even though these audiences are going to be very small, they're not open to the public. It's literally the monarch and their closest advisors uh, and friends and family. Uh, this would be a, this was a pretty substantial source of income for Shakespeare's company. So a Christmas performance might earn them a couple of pounds, which is uh, a, you know, maybe close to what they'd earn in a couple of months at the, the Globe Theater. So they took these performances seriously. And one thing we, we've recently come to realize is that they, Shakespeare's men did seem to sometimes change plays when they were going to perform them at court, change them usually by making them longer. There are a few of Shakespeare's plays where there's a short version and a long version. Uh, Hamlet is the, the classic one. There's a very short first quarto of Hamlet, and then there's the Hamlet you probably read in school, but also Romeo and Juliet, Henry V, they have short versions and long versions. And it seems that the short versions were the ones written for the public theater. Uh, they're usually plays that can be performed in under two hours, which if you're standing and watching a show, you really don't wanna do that for more than two hours. Uh, but if you're in court and you're seated and you're kind of comfortable, you're out of the elements and you have food, uh, you can sit around for a little while. You can watch a three and a half hour play. So for longer plays, Shakespeare would often add more dialogue, a lot of more speeches, usually uh, poetry, uh, uh, more uh, flowery verse. <laughs> so uh, I'm working on Romeo and Juliet now, and, that, and that's a big one. There are some parts in Romeo and Juliet that are kind of, uh, there's a scene where Juliet's mother uh, goes does an elaborate metaphor where she describes Paris as a book, which is absolutely inessential to the plot, but it's a nice bit of poetry, and it was probably added for the court performance. performance. So because Shakespeare's men derived a lot of income 
from the court, they would often step up their game and uh, add to the size of their play by adding poetic passages to them. So there we go. Um, so the next theater, we'll bring this back to, to Titus for a couple minutes. Um, next slide, please. This too, one of the, there's some debate about what this is. Specifically, whether this is an illustration based on an actual performance of Titus Andronicus, but I think it is, and we're gonna run with it. Uh, it's by a gentleman named Henry Peacham, who in a commonplace book of his, uh, drew this scene from Titus Andronicus, and I believe it's from the first act where Tamora is pleading for her son's lives, pleading to Titus. And that's Titus in the middle holding the spear, Tamora on her knees with the crown, uh, her son's behind her, Aaron the Moor is back there. And I believe that those are two of Titus's sons behind, behind him. Um, underneath, he has some lines from Titus and Tronicus. So I, I do believe clearly the drawing is associated with the, the text. It's dated 1595, although I actually think it's, it's quite a bit later than that. It's, this probably dates from the, the early 1610s. Uh, uh, the reason I like this theatrically is this is one of the, it, it tells us a little something about how costuming may have been done in Shakespeare's plays. You notice that, that Titus is in a traditional Roman costume. Uh, Aaron kind of looks like he's in a Moorish costume. But Titus's sons look more like English knights. So there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of concern with accurate, historically accurate costuming in the play. And I think that was the case for uh, a lot of English theater that, um, you know, a, a lot of you, you not so many nowadays, but a lot of people think Shakespeare's play should be staged as Shakespeare wanted them. But even in Shakespeare's time, there was some inconsistency uh, about that, what that was. Um, and can I go to the next slide? And I, I know we're, we're close to break, so I'm sorry. Um, and this is just the title page of Titus Andronicus itself, which says, uh, as it was played by the Right Honorable Earl of Derby, Derby Earl of Pembroke, uh, Earl of Sussex, their servants. This is very early in Shakespeare's career before he formed the uh, the Lord Chamberlain's men. So it, it gives a good example of sort of the uh, the very tenuous life of a play uh, early in the 1590s that different theater groups could perform it. And some of these like like the Earl of Pembroke didn't last very long and Titus was probably one of the few plays that actually staged. Uh, so before the Globe Theater started, these plays sort of got around. Um, okay, I, I do wanna take a break right now, I apologize. Um, but when we get back, I'm gonna talk about Titus Andronicus. I'm gonna start by talking about why people hated it and why people have come to like it now. And then I'll dig into some passages about the play. Let's come back at about, uh, a little after three, and uh, thank you.
All right, back to business. What's up with this play? Next slide, please. So a couple of things about it. It is probably the first Shakespeare had a first tragedy that Shakespeare had a hand in writing. It's one of the plays you probably started uh, in the late 1580s. I talked last week about how part of the appeal of Venus and Adonis was that Ovid was kind of a, a undergoing a revival in the 1590s and was a best-selling author. And Ovid permeates Titus and Andronicus as well. Lavinia's assault and mutilation is drawn from the story of Philomel in Ovid, which is referred to in the play. And a copy of Ovid's Metamorphoses is very key to the play as well. So it is also Shakespeare mining that Ovidian vein. Another thing, and this goes back to the, the conditions of uh, playwriting too, of performing. Shakespeare doesn't appear to have written Titus Andronicus alone. The first act was probably written by another playwright named George Peel. And if you read the play, the first act really does seem quite different from the rest of the, the, the play. It, it does seem a little more, uh, uh, how can I call it, uh, very rigid and classical, and it seems to be hewing closer to the Roman sources for the Titus story than uh, Shakespeare's part of the play does. Uh, George Peel was a very deep read in classical tragedy and he wrote plays that were modeled on classical plays. So it's very much his style and not Shakespeare's. But after that long first act, most of the rest of it is Shakespeare. There is one scene, the fly scene, where Titus uh, looks at Marcus killing a fly and initially gets angry at it until Marcus tells him the fly looks like Aaron Moore and Titus goes crazy. Uh, that was probably a later addition to the play. It's not in this first quarto of Titus Andronicus. It's in the second quarto of 1600. So it's probably added later. And some scholars now think that the addition was not by Shakespeare, but by Thomas Middleton. And the reason for all of this collaboration, there, there are two. Uh, one reason is efficiency. Playhouses, the theaters weren't run like they are now where a play will have like a five week run. Uh, it was, you'll do Titus on Monday, the Spanish tragedy on Wednesday, Hamlet on Friday, right? But you, you need a lot of plays to stage every day of the week. And so uh, in the 1590s, there weren't a lot of English plays. So the easy way to make more was to have authors collaborate. Often you would have one author do the main plot and another author do the subplot. So there's a lot of collaboration in this period. And also some uh, playwrights just like to work with one another. Shakespeare and Middleton seem to have worked on a few plays, Time of Athens, which we'll look at later, uh, maybe Macbeth. Uh, so there is some artistic collaboration as well, and Titus seems to be one of those. This title page, by the way, is the first edition of Titus Andronicus. There is only one copy of this in the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. So when they, whenever they reopen, go see it. Uh, next slide, please. So this just catalogs some of the uh, the, some of the, wow, that formatting did not last. Um, <laughs> the point of this is that throughout most of the reception history of this play, Titus Andronicus has not been well liked. Ben Jonson in 1614 makes fun of people who still consider uh, Andronicus and the Spanish tragedy as, quote, the best plays yet. Uh, it, he's making fun of people in 1614 who think these plays from the 1590s are still the best plays ever produced, uh, which suggests that while Titus and Spanish tragedy were popular in the 1590s, they were considered dated by the early 17th century. And other playwrights, uh, because of the strange subject matter of Titus, all of the blood and violence and weirdness, thought it couldn't be his. Edmund Ravenscroft, who would write, who would write an adaptation of this play, calls it the most incorrect and indigested piece in all Shakespeare's works, a heap of rubbish rather than a structure. Uh, a lot of editors of Shakespeare denied it was his at all, like Louis Theobald, who put together a collected work of Shakespeare in the 1700s. He calls it one of those plays which I have always thought ought not to be acknowledged in the list of Shakespeare's genuine pieces. 
it's so bad Shakespeare couldn't have written it. And even some modern critics too, uh, Robert e Roger Ebert, the late film critic, who is a very uh, learned fan of Shakespeare as well. He says, and he's talking about the film version here, but also about the play. He's, uh, Titus Andronicus was no doubt Hannibal Lecter's favorite Shakespeare play. It is a tragedy without a hero, without values, without a point, and therefore as modern as a horror exploitation film or a video game, it is not a catharsis, but a killing gallery where the, killer, where the characters speak in poetry. Uh, Roger Ebert probably accidentally echoing a lot of those 6th, 17th and 18th century critics who just found the play completely unshakespearean. But I like I want to pick up on that that reference to Hannibal Lecter, right? You've, if you've seen Silence of the Lambs or uh, the Hannibal TV series or things like that, that's an interesting comparison. Because uh, next slide, please. One of the crucial productions that really restored the reputation of Titus Andronicus was this, uh, I believe it was first stage in 1986. It was Deborah Warner's production of Titus Andronicus starring Brian Cox. And Brian Cox was really invested in the idea that Titus Andronicus isn't just a weird macabre play. It's actually really funny. It's a play about using the ways people might use humor to try to deal with suffering, to get through it, to alleviate it, whatever else. And, and they, this production treated it as kind of an, an absurdist drama, sort of like Samuel Beckett, right? Samuel, Samuel Beckett's plays uh, written in the face of the Great War and the horrors that people saw. What can you do? What is left after these horrors but just absurdity? Uh, all you can do is laugh, essentially. Uh, Brian Cox, around the time he was doing Titus Andronicus, was also, he was the first actor to play Hannibal Lecter on film in a, in a movie called Manhunter in 1986. So there's a trivia uh, bit for you. And I, I really think Hannibal Lecter is also, is a character who is, well, you know, he's a murderer and he eats people and he's unheroic, un but he does have that Baroque, macabre sense of dry, ironic humor that very much fits Titus Andronicus. And I really think Cox kind of collapsed both of these roles in a very interesting way. Uh, that that there, there is something lecturian about this performance. So uh, in recent years, people have been much more sympathetic to Titus Andronicus as a play about suffering that is maybe not as uh, just pointlessly bloody as people made it out to be. And the next slide, uh, I, I list some positive uh, um, references on this. Uh, Michael Billington, uh, one of the pleasures of my theater going life has been to watch its restoration to public favor. Instead of a Merlovian gore fest, it's seen a study in monumental suffering. And I think that's a nice uh, encapsule of what I think the play is trying to do. Um, a, a much earlier one, uh, uh, Schlegel, A.W. Schlegel. Uh, there is no lack of beautiful lines, bold images. He's, he's uh, impressed with the imagery, the style of the play. Uh, among these, we may reckon the joy of the treacherous more at the blackness and ugliness of his adulterous offspring. And I'll explain that later, but this is one of the interesting things Shakespeare does in making possibly the worst character in the play, also one with a, a, a bit of sympathy. So Schlegel's really uh, recognizing what is Shakespearean about this play. Even though the subject matter is very strange, there are still recognizable Shakespearean characters in here. Uh, Louis Geddes loves it because it's absolutely insane, and I certainly agree with that. And Cox's own assessment, he calls it the most interesting thing he's done in theater. It was a play that everyone usually avoided. It's difficult to do a young man's play written when Shakespeare was in his 30s, full of energy, joie de vie, and laughter that often strikes people as ludicrous. Uh, he didn't think any people wanted to play it on, on this occasion, uh, but he was going to go for it. And it's probably still the greatest stage performance I've, I've ever given. Uh, and it's that notion of, uh, the laughter that strikes people is ludicrous. Cox's performance really play, really, I think, takes that ludicrous element and, and runs with it and say, yes, it's ludicrous because 
it's people reacting in an absurd world. What can you do but laugh? And there is a scene in this that very much punctuates that. So to, to get into the play itself, uh, the, very, the very first act of this, uh, this Titus Andronicus begins in chaos. The next, next slide, please. Uh, where I have a couple of, I'll, I'll punctuate some text with images from various performances. And this is Titus's triumphant e entry in act one. And he's entering a world in chaos. The Roman emperor has died and his two sons, Saturninus and Bati Bastianus are arguing who should be the next emperor. And Saturninus is arguing he should be emperor because of his birthright. He was born first, Bastianus, is arguing he would be better for the people. And indeed, he does seem to be the more sympathetic candidate. Uh, but instead, the people want Titus to be emperor. And he is just coming back from having fought and defeated uh, the Goths. They're trying to uh, attack the, the Romans. Uh, he has won, and he is bringing in Goth prisoners, including the Goth queen, Tamora, and her Tamara. Tamora? I'm going to say Tamora, although it might be Tamara. The pronunciation is, is arbitrary. So here he enters triumphantly. And this, this is what, this is standard in productions of Titus. This is what marks him as the title, the heroic character. He is a war hero. The people love him. So what crisis is he faced with first? Because in Shakespeare play, when people love you, you're going to be faced with something that challenges that love. Next slide, please. We find out, and this is one of those weird George Peel things. Uh, we find out that Titus has 25 sons, poor Mrs. Titus Andronicus. 21 of those 25 sons have died in battle. The 25 children, right? One daughter, 24 boys, which again, poor Mrs. Andronicus. Um, as a, a kind of compensation for the death of his children, he demands that Tamora, the goth queen, her firstborn child may be put to, must be put to death. And this is the image that is on that illustration. Tamora is going to plead for her son's life. And a, a couple of lines here. Uh, Victorious Titus, rue the tears I shed, a mother's tears in passion for her son. And thy sons were ever dear to me. Oh, think my son to be as dear to, to me. Uh, you, your sons are dear to you. You're mourning their loss in battle. So is with mine. So please don't take my sons away. Suffice it not that we are brought to Rome to beautify thy triumphs and return captive to thee and to thy Roman yoke. Isn't it enough that we're prisoners? I, I beg you. Uh, if to fight for king and commonweal and commonwealth were piety in thy sons, it is in these. Just like you admire your sons for fighting for your country. I admire my sons for fighting in my country. Essentially, Tamar is trying to equate herself and Tyrus, her maternal love for his paternal love and begging for mercy at the very end. Sweet mercy is nobility's true badge. Thrice noble Titus, spare my firstborn son. If you are the noble ruler that people think you are, you'll show mercy on my son and not kill him. So early on, Titus says a sacrifice must be made of your older son. The mother pleads for her. She's literally on her knees. She's a sad, sympathetic character. So how does the wise, honored war hero Titus respond to this? Next slide. He doesn't care. He says, uh, patient yourself, madam. Pardon me. Uh, these are the brethren whom your Goths beheld alive and dead, and probably pointing to his dead sons who are being buried and, and others, right? These are the people who your sons saw when they were alive, and now they are dead. Uh, for their brethren slain religiously, they ask a sacrifice. Uh, to this your son is marked, and die he must to appease their growing shadows that they are gone. Nothing to be done. It's a sacrifice that must be made. Sorry? And Lucius, Titus's son, uh, offers, make a fire, uh, let's hew his limbs until they clean consumed. Uh, so Alarbus, who is uh, Tamora's oldest son, they're going to dismember him, which they do, and kill him. So it's not just a sacrifice, 
it's a really gruesome sacrifice. It takes place off stage, though, this one. Uh, and Tamora, oh, cruel, irreligious piety. So the purpose here, we, we see early on, Tamora is trying to appeal to Titus's sense of being a parent, of fairness, of mercy. Titus, he is a soldier. He is rigid. If a sacrifice is called for, it must be made. They're pleading nothing. Mercy is uh, not a factor here. And he kills her son uh, kind, of, kind of gruesomely. Now, things get a little weird here. Uh, so the people want Titus to be emperor. He denies it. Uh, he wants, he gives his voice to Saturninus. And it's kind of agreed that Saturninus will be emperor. Titus agrees that his daughter, Lavinia, will marry Saturninus. However, Lavinia is betrothed to Saturninus' brother, Bassianus, and he seizes her. And this upsets Titus, but Titus's the remaining sons side with Bassianus and Lavinia, right? They're betrothed, they love one another, they should be together. Titus is upset, a scuffle ensues, and in that scuffle, Titus kills his son, who kills another one of his sons. Uh, next slide, please. Which I think has the, the text here. Uh, Marcus, and, and this is his brother, you've, you've in a, with a dumb fight, you've killed your virtuous son. Titus, no foolish tribune, no, no son of mine, nor thou, nor these confederates in the deed that hath dishonored all our family unworthy brother and unworthy sons. And here again, we see Titus as rigid and set in his ways and almost acting without compassion, right? My son disobeyed me, therefore he must be put to death. And he doesn't want to bury him at first, although his family eventually talks him into to doing so. So right off the bat, we see Titus as someone really adherent of the old ways, of, of sacrifices that must be made, of paternal patriarchal law. And when these are broached, Titus will punish you no matter what, and apparently not feel a whole lot about that. Turns out though, even though after all of this, Saturninus, uh, Titus had agreed for Saturninus to marry his daughter, it turns out Saturninus has eyes for someone else. And that's Tamora, the goth queen. Next slide, please. And after this, this affair, they uh, Saturninus announces he is marrying Tamora. Lavinia, Bassianus can have you. Saturninus is going to be emperor with Tamora at his side. Uh, Titus has been double-crossed. Now, Tamora is the one we've just seen pleading for the life of her sons on her knees and publicly when she's asked by Saturninus, if, if he will, uh, basically put it up without revenge. Are you not going to take revenge on Titus for killing your eldest son? Publicly, she says, she says no, because, you know, is against God and against the law. But privately is that speech below. Uh, I I'll find a day to massacre them all and raise their faction and their family. The cruel father and his traitorous son for whom I sued for my dear son's life and make them know what tis to let a queen kneel in the street and beg for grace in vain. This is kind of a Game of Thrones thing, right? You made, you made me beg for my mercy. I have power now. I'm going to get Titus back. Although she says that in private, under her breath. So with all of this, we're, we're really, at the end of the first act, very conflicted. Titus is supposed to be the hero. He comes in triumphantly. He's won a war. The people love him. But at his hand, two people die for what seem like arbitrary and kind of pointless reasons. Tamara, we see at first, uh, begging for her son's life, making an eloquent plea for a mother's mercy. But now we hear her... Uh, expressing, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deceive them. I'm going to get him and back. So it's hard to get a read on all of these characters here. And I think that just amplifies how much chaos and disorder there is in the first scene of this play. And now with Tamara, Tamora, 
uh, the element of revenge has been added to this mix because she wants revenge on her son, uh, revenge that may be justified. So next we, we meet another character in this next passage, someone in Tamora's retinue, and that is, you can go to the next slide, uh, and that is Aaron the Moor. And he is, a, he is a, a black Moor, the first Moorish character that Shakespeare is going to create. You're probably most familiar with uh, Othello, uh, who is uh, depicted as someone who is, uh, trying to make his way in a European society, but he, he ultimately fails because Iago gets in his ear and poisons him. Aaron the Moor is not this. And in fact, he, he's, he's quite the opposite. In fact, a lot of his speeches, he brags about how evil he is. And here in his opening speech in the play, he talks about how uh, much power he's going to have because it turns out he and Tamora are an item. Even though she is marrying Bassianus, she and Aaron the Moor are having uh, have a relationship that is going to continue, even though she is with Saturninus. But that's okay with Aaron, because as he says in this speech, now climbeth Tamora Olympus top, now Tamora has become king, has become a queen, uh, safe out of fortune shot and sits a lot and, and sits aloft. She is immune to the vicissitudes of fortune and she sits on high. Um, gallops the Zodiac and his, glist his glistering coach and overlooks the highest peering heels, so Tamora. Then Aaron, arm thy heart and fit thy thoughts to mount aloft with thy imperial mistress and mount her pitch whom now in triumph long hath prisoner held fettered in amorous chains uh, and faster bound to Aaron's charming eyes uh, than is Prometheus tied to Caucasus. Uh, so now that she has power, I'm going to have power too. And we see Ta Aaron as a person with a lust for this kind of power that he's looking to share with. Uh, and this Shakespeare is playing into some more... Moorish stereotypes uh, of uh, Moors being angry and violent and amoral and sexually amoral and all of these things. So at the beginning, Shakespeare creates Aaron as this almost stereotypical uh, Moorish character in a way that we would we would we now a lot of people consider racist. Although we're going to see that he tries to give some depth to this character, I think. So with a uh, next slide, please, which, which is just a couple of images of uh, uh, how Aaron is often portrayed on, uh, on stage, uh, dressed in, in Morris garb. Um, and as I said before, like Othello is, his crisis is trying to, to fit in with this European culture, but uh, a culture that undermines him. Ultimately, we feel sympathetic to Othello because he has been uh, misled. Uh, on the other hand, Her Aaron wants power. He wants to be a disruptive force, where Othello wants to be, at least at first, a unifying force. Aaron is, is just evil. And we see that right away. Uh, next slide. As Tamara has a plan that Aaron helps put in action, at the end of Act One, they're all going to go out hunting. And uh, her two, uh, this is yes, yeah. Her two remaining sons, they both have their eyes on Lavinia too. And in this speech, I won't read the, the left-hand column of this. In this speech, they're both kind of arguing about which one of them is most suitable for Tamora, and figuring out how they can woo her. And Aaron overhears this and makes fun of this. Demetrius and Cryon, Tamora's sons, are, are kind of idiots. Um, but Aaron puts an idea in their head. Uh, he notes that they're out on, on a, a hunt in open fields where there are a lot of nooks and crannies and places to hide. And he says, many unfrequented plots there are. There are many, un, uh, many places to hide out on a hunt. Fitted by kind for rape and villainy, single you tip of them this dainty dough, this dainty dough and strike her home by force, if not by words, 
this way or not at all stand you in hope. So the short of it, and this is Aaron as disruptor, why are you worrying with all this romantic woo stuff? She's gonna be alone in the forest or she can be alone in the forest, just take her uh, and, and make her yours. And putting this idea in Demetrius and Crian's head is key to Lavinia's plan. As uh, plot-wise, so they go on the hunt. Uh, Aaron, he's going to, he, the plan is to set Bassanius up. Bassanius and Lavinia are out on the, the hunt. Uh, they, I'm sorry, Bassinia and Lavinia run into Aaron and Tamara, uh, and Aaron kills Bassinius, throws him in a ditch, and he's going to make it look like, uh, uh, anyway, kills Bassinius and throws him in a ditch, I'm sorry, uh, and Tamora has her two sons face uh, Lavinia, and essentially she tells her sons to have their way with, with Lavinia. And in this sequence, uh, she tells the sons, uh, I'm sorry, go to the next slide. I'm sorry, I, I thought I'd going to move your hand. Yes, uh, in this scene, Lavinia knows her sons are going to assault her and it's gonna be horrible. So she tries to make a plea to Tamora, uh, teach me for thy father's sake, that gave thee life when well might when well he might have slain thee. Be not obdurate, open thy deaf ears. My father spared your life, please spare mine. Uh, Tamora says no uh, and tells her sons, remember boys, I poured forth tears in vain to save your brother from the sacrifice, but fierce Andronicus would not relent. Therefore away with her and use her as you will. The worse to her, the better loved of me. The worse you treat her, the more you show you love me. This is Tamara getting her revenge. I pleaded for the life of my son and Andronicus wouldn't give it to me. So now I'm gonna take his daughter away. Tamora ple uh, Lavinia pleased her calling Tamora a gentle queen and asked to just be murdered and not uh, assaulted or tortured. Tamora denies this. Um, so here, as we in the first act, we saw Tamora be motherly, trying to protect her son. And early on, it gives her. We have a twinge of sympathy for her. We kind of hope that Titus will listen to her plea, and he doesn't. But now Lavinia is making a similar plea to Tamora that Tamora had made to Titus earlier, and Tamora is having not, nothing of this. Uh, he is uh, leading. Uh, she is leading Lavinia to, well, something very bad happened to her. So Tamora, this, uh, one way you can say this, and there are a couple ways you can look at it, and this is a sort of crisis that makes revenge tragedy very interesting. Tamora, does she have a right to revenge because Titus wouldn't show mercy? Possibly. Is Tamora being corrupted by Aaron the Moor, who is this embodiment of savagery and violence? Possibly. But in any case, Tamora is seen here as kind of corrupted and irredeemable, where we might have had some sympathy for her in the first act. Now the, the next slide. Oh. Lavinia is taken off stage, and uh, we'll find out that Chiron and Demetrius, they do sexually assault her, so she can't report the crime. She can't, so she can't speak to anyone. They cut out her tongue, so she can't point to the murderers. They cut off her hands. And uh, Marcus comes out looking for her. This is Titus's brother. And he sees something moving in the background. And this would be Lavinia entering the this, this stage again. And actually, we can go to the, the next image, because this is often a big part of productions of Titus Andronicus and, and some uh, images of how. Lavinia comes out disheveled, covered in blood. They range from naturalistics, like the, the image on the left of Rose Reynolds in the RSC production or Laura Lee's above, sometimes very stylized, uh, um, like the Japanese production in the lower left-hand corner. 
Marcus gives a very long speech while Lavinia stands on stage for, for a, a couple of minutes. Uh, while Marcus narrates her pain, he says things like, what stern and gentle hands hath lopped and hewed and made thy body bare of her two branches, those sweet ornaments, uh, why, dost thou, why, why dost not speak to me? Why don't you speak to me? Alas, a crimson river of warm blood. Uh, Marcus tries to get her to talk when she tries to talk, and this is often a dramatic moment. Blood comes out of her mouth, and he realizes that she doesn't have a, a tongue. And what this does is it makes her, it really makes her almost a, a pseudo-religious emblem of suffering. We're really meant to take in how much Lavinia has suffered, right? This, this isn't just a, uh, the, the almost casual murder of Titus's sons uh, or uh, Alarbus in, in the first act, really faced with this act of violent here. And Marcus narrates how horrible it is. So this is where I think the play is trying to make us understand or relate to suffering. And I think this is where this theme comes in. It becomes even more so, we go to the, the next slide. Uh, once Titus sees what happens to his daughter, he changes too. He finally understands this sort of pain. Where in the first act, we see him as rigid and unwilling to demonstrate any sort of mercy. Uh, once he sees and experiences what happens to his daughter, he feels more inclined to showing uh, mercy. Um, so uh, next slide, what happens plot wise? So Aaron uh, is uh, a couple of um, Titus's sons are looking for Bassianus, but Aaron the Moor has hidden Bassianus in a pit with a thing of money, a, a bag of gold, and he has forged a letter. And the letter says that a couple of Titus's sons uh, have, uh, um, it's, uh, who is it? Qu Lucius and Quint, uh, I'm sorry, Quintus and Martius, uh, Titus, two of Titus's sons have murdered Bassianus. So he's setting two of Titus's sons up for murder. His sons do indeed find the body. They fall into the pit in kind of a comic scene and they are arrested. Uh, Aaron comes to Titus and says, I will free your sons, but I want your hand. I want you to cut your hand off. And Titus's brother, uh, Martius, says, you can have my hand instead. Lucius says, you can have my hand instead. And they kind of run off to get a, get a saw. And Titus, while his brother and son have gone, asks Aaron to cut off his hand so his sons would, would come back. Uh, and this, this speech, right, lend me thy hand, I will give thee mine. Uh, Aaron does indeed do the job and cuts it off. And at the very, the, the last part on the right that I have up here, uh, I go Andronicus and for thy hand, look by and by to have thy sons with thee. Now that I have your hand, I will return your sons aside their heads, I mean. Oh, how this villainy doth fat me with the very thoughts of it. Let fools do good and fair men call for grace. Aaron will have his soul black like a face, like his face. Uh, so his sons are already dead and beheaded and he's going to return Titus's sons to Titus, except they're already dead. And in fact, he does do that, returning the heads of the sons and uh, Titus's severed hands. Aaron again brags at how evil he is. And in one of those uh, lines that exemplify the racist attitudes a lot of England had towards people of African descent, right? His soul is as black as his sin. My actions are just as dark as my, my skin. Aaron again here being presented as something of a Moorish stereotype. Titus's reaction to this on the next slide. I, I think I have an image here of, yes, here's an, here's an example of Titus uh, kind of agreeing to have his hand cut off, which I'm, I'm, I'm always, uh, again, looking for the, the humorous bits in the play. 
I, I don't see how Titus thinks it would go out. It, it would happen any differently. Uh, this might still be Titus being a man of honor, thinking that if someone gives you their word, they'll exchange, you know, my sons for my hand. They'll they'll certainly do it, and they wouldn't they wouldn't try to fool me. That he underestimates how evil Aaron is. Uh, but I always this this is part of the play that I, I think uh, I. I I find funny, I'm, I, but I might be a horrible person. Uh, but the next slide, what, what happens to Titus? Uh, so uh, it, it is brought back. Uh, Marcus, again, who is kind of the Horatio in this play, reporting what happens. Uh, See thy son's two heads, thy warlike hand, thy mangled brother here. The other banished son with his dear sight struck pale and bloodless. Uh, Lucius is, is uh, quiet at the scene. Uh, your daughter's been assaulted. Uh, what are you going to do, Titus? And Titus's response to this list of horrors in that opening paragraph I have quoted here, Titus's response, ha, ha, ha. In productions, this is often where Titus breaks. What can you do in the face of your daughter being assaulted and mutilated, more sons being killed, you've been double-crossed, You've lost a limb. All of this suffering, all of this pain, what can you do but but laugh, right? I have, Titus explains it, I have not another tear to shed. To shed. This sorrow is an enemy and would usurp upon my watery eyes and make them blind with tributary tears. What good is sorrow? This is so much pain that I can't possibly handle it. So the way he literally reacts to this pain is by laughing at it. And it is that absurd laugh that you might associate with someone like Samuel Beckett. What do you do in the face of all of these unspeakable horrors when sorrow isn't enough to deal with them? You just have to <sighs> go a bit crazy. And Titus goes a bit crazy. Uh, the scene after this is the fly scene where he gets angry at a fly. He starts shooting arrows with sayings on them into Saturninus's house. And uh, he himself starts thinking of a way to get revenge. In the interim, next, next slide, please. Hmm. But to get revenge, you need to know who did the wrong. And with Lavinia unable to talk uh, or, or point, um, a right, right? She can't identify the names of her attackers. Um, but this is this is from uh, scene six, and it begins kind of. It's another one of those, especially after Titus's laugh of absurdity. Uh, there are some scenes in the play that I think are supposed to be morbidly funny, and this scene opens with Lavinia kind of chasing uh, Puer, this this boy around, and he's kind of afraid of her, and she's she's kind of chasing after him. And I think it's supposed to be something that's this weirdly funny. Um, they ask her what's wrong. And apparently she's been reading Ovid. And she opens the book of Ovid and points to the story of Philomel. And this tells them that uh, she's, she'd been sexually assaulted. This is the story of Philomel uh, who was raped and similarly had her uh, tongue cut out and her hands cut off. So she's revealed exactly what the extent of the crime is. And right after this, Marcus actually has her hold a stick under her chin and he shows her how to write. And she writes the name of Chiron and Demetria. She writes the name of her uh, attackers. So uh, Lavinia, in a, in a way, right? I guess one of her story is that even though she finds herself at in a, in a horrible situation, uh, she manages to find a way to communicate. There, there are bits in the play where she seems to be doing sign language to signal things. So uh, I mean, Lavinia comes across as a, a rather strong character here, right? Someone who is going to help her father avenge her attackers, which might make her ending kind of ironic, but we'll talk about that in, in a bit. So uh, the murderers have now been discovered. Uh, go next. Um, next slide, please. 
Uh, in the interim, a complication with Aaron's character. He has been having an affair with Tamora. Tamora has just had a child. Uh, Aaron is a person of color. Tamora is not. And it's very clear when this new child is born that the child is not Saturninus's, who is married to Tamora, that it is Aaron. And it will reveal their, uh, their affair. So we have a problem here. So the nurse here suggests uh, the son is delivered. She calls the son uh, a devil. Uh, the nurse calls the son a joyless, dismal, black, and sorrowful issue, right? This child, and again, associating the skin color with some sort of inner uh, moral imperfection, right? Um, it's the, sh the short of this. Um, Aaron is offended by this, right? He, even though Tamora wants the child killed, the nurse wants the child killed, his... Tamora's sons want the child killed. Aaron won't. Chiron, it shall not live. Aaron, it shall not die. Next slide, please. And this is where we see a, a little bit of depth to, to Aaron. Uh, this speech, uh, I'm going to find some highlights. Uh, Sooner this sword will plow thy bowels up. Stay, murderous villains. We will kill your brothers. Uh, he threatens anyone who touches his son with, with death. Um, what, ye sanguine, sallow-hearted boys, ye white-limbed walls, ye alehouse-painted signs, what is color, he's asking. Coal black is better than another hue in that it scorns to bear another hue. Right? Black is the best color because it rejects all other color. And this was uh, early modern theory of color in this play, that, that black was created by the absence of, of other colors. Um, uh, in that it scorns to another hue, for all the water in the ocean can never turn the swan's black legs to white, although she laved them hourly in the flood. Tell the empress from me I am of age to keep my own, excuse it how she can. So Aaron, uh, a uh, Shakespeare scholar, uh, Aliana Thompson, called this the first black power speech in English literature. Because Aaron is essentially saying, uh, I, black is a perfect color for me and my son. I'm proud of it. You think he's a devil just because he's black. I'm going to keep my son. And for the rest of the play, Aaron is invested in keeping his son alive, even though everyone wants to kill her. And he's going to go uh, into the Goths' territory and uh, as a means of trying to, to preserving him. So even though earlier in this play, we see Aaron as a paragon of, of evil. He literally turns to the audience and talks about how much he loves doing evil. But here we see um, a, a fatherly pride in this son being born. We see a little bit of humanity in him. So even though Shakespeare is really tracking, he's working with racist stereotypes here, he also still, even doing so, gives a little bit of insight, gives a little bit of depth, gives a little bit of humanity to this character. And in generally, I think, in general, I think this is what Shakespeare is great as. Even when his characters view close to a particular type, even offensive type, he finds something, he gives them something to show them as a well-rounded person. Aaron is completely evil. He deserves what punishment he, he gets, but uh, there is more to somebody than, than that. Uh, let me see, what's the, the next slide? Ah, yes, okay. Uh, so, um, this is this mostly closes out the Aaron plot, although we, we, we do see him at the end. He is he is captured by the, the Goths, and they are going to hang him. And actually, we can go to the next the next visual slide, uh, the next one, uh, a stage production of they they put Aaron on a ladder and they threaten to kill him. And um, Aaron makes a deal with them. Uh, just you know, do what you want with me. I'll tell you all the horrors that I've been involved with, uh, but just protect my son. Uh, and they agree to this. 
And after he articulates that he was behind the assault on Lavinia and setting up Titus's sons, Lucius asks him, art thou not sorry for these heinous deeds? Aaron, I, that I had not done a thousand more, even now I curse the day. And yet I think few come within the compass of my curse, wherein I did not, where I did not some notorious ill as kill a man or else devise his death. Do you feel sorry for your crimes, Aaron? No, I feel sorry that I didn't do more crime. Uh, and later he'll say, if I did anything good, I repent that. So Aaron is still uh, unreformed, right? Committed to evil, even though, again, we see a little bit of interiority to him. We see he is capable of some sort of mercy, but not to the Goths and not to the Romans. And he is still the uh, frightening embodiment of, of evil. Um, can I go to the, the next slide? I can try to wrap this in really quickly. I might, I can stay a couple of, I can wrap this up in 10 minutes and I can stay a little couple of minutes extra if people want to ask questions. This is a, a, another way that Aaron's, uh, the, typical of more recent productions, this is a very defiant Aaron at, at the end. And maybe we can read his, uh, desire to protect your son as a kind of defiance, right? Everyone else wants him dead, but he wants the son alive. So we'll go to the main plot, Titus's plot. So Titus is going a little bit insane. Tamara has a plan. He thinks she's going to send Titus completely over the edge and will want to kill himself. If, her idea, she'll put on a pageant of revenge and she'll appear to Titus at night when he's sleeping and you think he'll be dreaming of revenge and revenge's sidekicks, uh, rape and murder, who will be played by Chiron and Demetrius. And they'll put on this mask and make Titus feel really depressed and Titus will kill himself. They do this, Titus sees the mask, but I don't think he's fooled at all. He sees it's Tamora and her sons. She asks revenge, can I keep your sons with me while you go off and do, do revenge things? And she stupidly does. And Titus, uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, and with his own act of pageantry, he ties the sons up, hangs them upside down, has Lavinia get a basin, and he explains to the sons what he's going to do. And what he is going to do is uh, butcher them and kill them. Park villains, he says, I will grind your bones to dust, and with your blood I'll make a paste, and of the paste a coffin I will rear, and make two pasties of your shameful head. Uh, and bid that strumpet your unhallowed dam like to the earth swallow her or increase. So he tells the boys as they're hanging before he kills them, I'm going to kill you, cook you, and make your mom eat you. And he does so on stage while Lavinia is holding the basin underneath them. Next slide. Uh, this is another kind of iconic, memorable image from uh, Titus Andronicus. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, this, this is what happens. It's, it's Baroque, it's macabre, it's absurd, it's kind of funny watching this woman try to balance a bowl full of, full of blood. By this time, most actors play Titus as completely off his rocker, uh, so it, it's kind of an insane scene. And at once, we are, uh, as, a, as an audience, we are, on one hand, yes, this man has avenged the people who mutilated his daughter, good for him. On the other hand, it's, it's a bit much. I, I don't know about that. But we're glad he got revenge, but it's, I'm kind of afraid of him. I don't know if he can rejoin polite society. Fortunately or unfortunately, he won't rejoin polite society. Next slide, please. Um, so he does hold the banquet. He does indeed play the cook. I'll show you a picture of him, I think, in a chef's hat somewhere down the line. Um, he will play the cook, and he does make uh, feed Tamora and Saturninus a, a pie. He asked them hypothetically at one point, uh, did you, uh, my lord the emperor resolved me thus, was it well done of Virginius to slay his daughter with his own right hand because she was enforced and stained and deflowered? It's a very Roman thing, right? If your daughter's been sexually assaulted and just the noble thing for her to do is to kill herself. This is the subject of Shakespeare's Lucrece. 
Um, it's horrifying, but nevertheless, it's one of those stoic Roman principles that Titus still kind of adheres to. Saturninus says yes, and so uh, in response, uh, Titus reveals his daughter who is serving the meal while wearing a mask and kills her. Uh, and this shocks Saturninus and Tamora. Uh, Saturninus, what have you done? Unnatural and unkind, he says. Next slide, please. Uh, Titus, and, and this, here's a picture of the banquet and Tamora from an RSC production. Next, next slide, please. Um, uh, will it please you not? Please eat, he asks them to. Uh, why have you slain your daughter thus? And he says, I didn't kill them. Tryron and Demetrius killed them because they assaulted her, and it was they who did this. Saturninus, go, get, get her sons. And Titus, why, there they are, both baked in this pie, whereof their mother daintily hath fed, eating the flesh that she herself had bred. Tis true, tis true, witness my wife's sharp point. So this is the big cathartic moment of the play where Titus reveals that Lavinia has eaten her own son as punishment for uh, assaulting hers. There is a, a, a lot of violence here. Titus kills, uh, Saturninus kills Titus. Titus kills the emperor. Lucius kills Saturninus. There is disorder, uh, but it, unusually for a, a, a revenge tragedy, this one ends fairly well. Uh, Aaron's, uh, Titus's last son, Lucius, will become the emperor. Everyone is united by the horrors that Aaron and uh, Tamora have unleashed. They feel pity at what happened to Lavinia and what happened to Titus. And they treat Lucius as they did Titus at the beginning. He will be the good person to uh, rule the country. At the very end of the play, to illustrate how justice is going to be restored, uh, next slide, please. And this, this slide is just a, a picture of uh, Brian Cox in the chef's hat. I, I think he innovated the chef's hat to play the cook as Titus Andronicus uh, because he, he is habited like a cook, I believe the stage directions read. Uh, but the next slide ends the play and Aaron's plot. Uh, and this is where Lucius sentences Aaron to be buried um, breast deep in earth and fanish him. They're not going to, to cut his head off. They're going to bury him in the sand up to his chest and let him starve. And Aaron is, again, defiant to the last. Uh, why should wrath be mute and fury dumbed? I am no baby. I, with base prayers, I would repent the evils I had done. 10,000 worse than ever I did would I perform if I might have my will. If one good deed in my life I did, I do repent it to my very soul. So the very end, we're getting a reminder that even though we see a little bit of humanity in Aaron, he's still going out saying, I wish I'd done more evil, and if I did anything good, that's what I repent. Uh, so he's going to go out somewhat gruesomely. And this is the, uh, if there is an ambiguity to the end of this play, it is that though Lucius has restored order, uh, it is another macabre death of Aaron. Uh, and we've already seen that these Baroque deaths tend to lead to other deaths. Uh, Titus killing Tamora's son leads to Tamora's son getting revenge on Titus's son, which leads to Titus getting revenge on Tamora. Um, is this the end of these heinous crimes, or is it another cycle beginning? So, uh, next slide, uh, which, are, which is, yes, just, now. Uh, just a, another uh, good tickle brain cartoon, Titus Andronicus. Uh, she summarizes it as death, just lots of death, and lots and lots of death, and rape and mutilation, too. I think that undersells the play. I, I do think it is in Titus's character. Uh, and even to some extent, Tamora and Aaron's character, it's uh, a, a it's about suffering. It's about uh, filial, uh, paternal, maternal responsibilities. Uh, it is very much a, a play about revenge. Is there justification for revenge or benefit to it? At different parts of the play, we see maybe Tamara is entitled to it. Maybe Titus is entitled to it. But the gruesomeness of the play suggests that maybe Francis Bacon and the Bible are right that in human hands, uh, revenge is, is not a good thing. 
Um, how do we balance family and mercy with the law and tradition? That's something Titus needs to learn. Before that, he's rigidly adhering to the law uh, until he sees his daughter and then um, uh, he realizes that may have been an error. And what catharsis is there in suffering for us or for the audience? To what degree are we supposed to watch this play and think, good, everyone evil gets what they deserve. Titus goes out as a tragic hero. And to what extent are we supposed to think, eh, that's, that none, none of this is good. Uh, I, I think we maybe we should rethink revenge as a, a concept. So this isn't one of Shakespeare's deepest or most profound plays, but I do think there's a lot in there. And uh, I, I think it's it certainly deserves better than its early reputation suggests. So final slide. Uh, this is all I have. I'll, I'll keep, I've gone late. I'm sorry. I have too much to say. Um, next week, we'll go to the opposite end of Shakespeare, and we'll look at Coriolanus, which I think is always a good play to read in an election season, because it's about uh, what, we, what people ask of rulers, what rulers ask of people, and, uh, well, it's, it's, there's, there's only one death in this one, so it's, it's quite different from Titus. Um, I'll stick around for a couple minutes for questions. Otherwise, thank you very much for listening. Feel free to email things and I'll respond uh, somehow. And uh, thank you. Hello? I think I can hear. I'm sorry? Could you repeat the question? Why is Shakespeare called the Bard? Ah, well, he wasn't called the Bard in his own time. The, the bard is a, a uh, nickname that's appended to him in the, uh, the 18th century. I think someone, and I, I don't have who it is right now, uh, writes, calls him the bard in a dedicatory poem, and it becomes a, a name for him. Uh, the bard, the poet, it's a way of signifying that he is the most important poet in, in English literature but it's, it's a modern nickname. It's, it's not something that, that they did in Shakespeare's time. Mm -hmm. oh, okay.